ability to upgrade these programs and assure they are sustainable. President Muhammadu Buhari inaugurates Economic Advisory Council at Lines its mandate. He's articulated all the right, um, the right issues to create an environment that is enabling for businesses to thrive. Participants at 9th Nordic Africa Business Summit in Norway plugged federal government economic growth plan. Senate commences second reading of 2020 appropriation bill and passes stringent revenue generation system every fiscal year. Today, Good Morning Nigeria, we bring you second phase discussion of the 2020 appropriation bill. Obviously, major conversation now are dominated by the 2020 appropriation bill of uh, 10.33 trillion naira, which President Muhammadu Buhari presented to a joint session of the National Assembly on Tuesday this week. Yes, uh, tagged budget of continuity for sustaining growth and job creation. The sum of 2.46 trillion naira is proposed for capital projects with increase in the budget for Human Rights Commission from 1.5 billion naira to 2.5 billion. Uh, amongst the particulars of the budget is the pegging of an oil benchmark at $57 per barrel. But overall, the budget has a projected deficit of 2.18 trillion naira that is expected to be financed through avenues such as privatization proceeds, signature bonuses, and drawdowns on loans already secured for specific development projects. Uh, and Kinsley, we, we noted yesterday that uh, at the speech by the president, uh, which uh, of course uh, he, he raised concerns uh, over VAT gaps in meeting expectations of last budget, uh, that has necessitated the draft finance bill proposing an increase of the VAT rate from 5% to 7.5%. Well, that's right, Kiria. Now, the appropriation bill is. Uh, Based on this uh, new VAT rate, why the additional revenues will be expected to be used to fund health, education, and infrastructure programs. But to most indicate that uh, for the federal government, the expected receipts from the VAT increase will still be is 15% to the extent that states and local governments usually get the remainder of all VAT revenues being 85%, expected, of course, to uh, enhance the services at the subnational entities. Exactly. And uh, there are divergent views to the issue, but of concern to many is the need for robust economic growth, especially as pharmaceuticals and some food items like white and brown bread, fish and others were exempted from the VAT increase. Now, some other points to note in the 2020 uh, budget already represented include uh, the continued strict implementation of the TSA, that is the Treasury Single Account, plus the directives to stop the salary of any federal government staff that is not captured on the integrated uh, personnel and payroll information system, that is IPS platform, by the end of this month, being October 2019. And also agencies, or all agencies, uh, to obtain the necessary approvals before embarking on any fresh recruitment as a contravention uh, of these directives shall attract severe sanctions. But what are the fears for certain MDAs and government agencies concerning the IPPIS? And also going by the uh, budget presentation, works and uh, housing, power and defense, of course, uh, take the lion's share, Why social investment uh, programs have uh, 30 billion naira, and the amnesty uh, program is given 65 billion naira. President Muhammad Buhari had said that uh, the 2020 budget is expected to accelerate the pace of the country's economic recovery, promote economic diversification, enhance competitiveness, and ensure, ensure social inclusion. He expressed optimism that the country will attain more inclusive GDP growth in creating jobs and uh, tackling 
poverty. Well, the National Assembly has already begun action on the appropriation bill with the commencement of the second reading of, of the bill. Now, this would certainly underlines the promise of the Assembly to uh, strive to return the nation's budget to the January to uh, December cycle. But one question to also ask is how can the administration of President Muhammad Buhari best achieve its priorities of social investment, infrastructural upgrade, and fiscal prudence? And how well do Nigerians understand that it is also no longer business as usual? Are there likely gaps in the implementation of the budget going forward? And what are the issues that we need to be concerned about? Answers and uh, more on uh, today's edition of uh, Good Morning Nigeria will come actually when we engage our guests on the program today. So on that note, we'd like to welcome you formally to today's edition of the program. My name is Kirian Umayo. And I'm Kingsley Osadolo. I join my colleague Kirian in also welcoming you to today's edition of program and Kieran, just to would need to remind uh, some of our viewers who probably didn't have the benefit of uh, watching yesterday but of course we hope that you watch the program this is the second part of our conversation on the appropriation bill 2020 we had a conversation yesterday uh, with four of our regular guests who normally uh, will be with us when we are discussing economic or financial matters right here in the Abuja studios as well as from network centers in Lagos and Port Harcourt for today we'll have a conversation as we said part two and uh, regular complimentary segments. This includes news support review, business, and uh, others. In the meantime, let's join Abdul Malik Adio for the highlights of the morning news. Good morning, Malik. Good morning, Kingsley, and good morning, Kirian. Welcome to the morning news. Now, President Mohamedou Bahari has promised to devote all his time and energy towards promoting national unity in the greater interest of the country and all Nigerians. The President stated this while receiving a delegation of Benue State Council of Traditional Rulers led by Tiv, Professor James Ayetse. Whatever politics does, politics will go away. The relationship between the Fulani and Tiv that is long standing and predates Nigeria. Nothing can destroy it. And at a time when we have a brother, the full animal on the tree, we should receive very bountiful fruits coming down to us. That's why uh, we thought it uh, appropriate to have a minister for humanitarian affairs so that uh, demands can be coordinated under uh, one minister. So that we don't duplicate uh, the newly constituted presidential economic advisory council has been inaugurated with a mandate to coordinate and synthesize ideas and efforts towards giving more impetus to the nation's economic growth plan for sustainable future of the country president Mohamedou Buhari will perform the ceremony particularly charge the members to develop a reliable data for homegrown solution to the nation's social economic challenges. Many of the ideas we developed in the last four years were targeted at taking Nigeria back to the path of growth. I am sure, as you are aware, as a government, we prioritize agriculture as a critical sector to create jobs and bring prosperity to our rural communities. Our programs covered the entire agricultural value chain from seed to fertilizer to grains and ultimately our dishes. You can clearly see the impact. Participants at the ninth Nordic Africa Business Summit in Norway have described the economic growth plan of the federal government as a step in the right direction, with Vice President Yemi Oshinbajo representing the country. Participants, most of them investors, promised to make use of the opportunity provided by government. He's articulated all the right, um, the right issues to create an environment that is enabling for businesses to thrive. I think he has said the very right things and he has done a very good job in projecting the image of Nigeria. From the, uh, the, the feedback that we've been getting, you know, this has been uh, a, a most useful uh, forum, you know, uh, for 
for, for, for Nigeria to interact with, uh, with investors and business people uh, from Norway and other Nordic, uh, Nordic countries. Over the past years, uh, four years especially, we have seen a dramatic improvement in the ease of doing business uh, very positively. Now, GTech Technology Week is not only a hub to display tech innovations, it provides a marketplace for investors as well. And our experience is leaving no stone unturned at the African Investment Forum to drive financial flows to the nation's fast growing ICT sector and other key areas of the economy. Any potential investor who fails to invest in Nigeria will definitely regret sooner or later. Look at our contribution to GDP. The contribution of ICT to GDP is 13.86%. About 60% of Nigerians are youth. Youth means they are millennial and generation Z. Technology uh, is, is the one tool that we could really leverage to enable that future of uh, peace, abundance and prosperity. Now, budget performance is significantly dependent on the strength of the, its revenue generation, therefore to ensure an impressive performance of the 2020 budget. The Senate has conversed stringent revenue generation treatment system in the 2020 fiscal year. The Senators who commenced the consideration of the 2020 appropriation bill also observed that the draft financial bill submitted by the President will improve the nation's revenue. We have to now really think out of the box from this chamber so that we can make the relevant laws that drive this economy in order for this economy to regenerate revenue. If we need to change, we must be able to look at the critical fundamentals of this uh, uh, budget speech and make adjustments as due. In keeping with its resolve of working with the executive to meet the yearnings of Nigerians, the House of Representatives commenced debate of the 2020 appropriation bill, laying the ground for legislative scrutiny in line with the constitutional mandate. And members, House members across party lines uh, have commenced proposed spending and revenue generation projection as contained in the document. What will be done and it will cut across the whole six geopolitical zones of the Federation. This will enhance our security, it will enhance movement and enhance better transportation system in the country. The philosophical cornerstone around which this budget involves is investing in critical infrastructure, creating jobs and human capital development. Another measure put forward by Mr. President is a provision in the social investment program. This is a welcome development. Now, the federal government is seemingly not proud of the number one world ranking in open defecation looming for Nigeria. State governments who are joining the federal government to take the country out of this unfavorable list as the Jigawa state government joins the League of States declaring state of emergency on water sanitation and hygiene and wash sector. Every water point that you can think of that is in this state, we georeferenced it and we pinpointed every location. Uh, I would want to believe since that time the situation has improved even further. I'm sure I understand this is the bill today. Uh, I will be second in this country following Kosiva. Nigeria is said to be grappling with a series of high-profile crimes that constitute major threats to our national security. This include banditry, kidnapping, armed robbery, cattle rustling, cyber crimes, as well as small and light arms proliferation. Worried by this threat, the Minister of Police Affairs, Mohamed Megari Dengyadi, is seeking ways to reposition the police force for effective service delivery. To ensure that we get the funding the police needs and we will also inject new ideas into policing of our dear nation.
In order to effectively tackle the identified challenges, my vision is to evolve a police force that is rule of law guided, active. That's the news highlight. Good morning, Nigeria continues with Kirian and Kingsley after the break. Many thanks for watching. The new edition of TV Guide is out. Exclusively, taking a look at the traditional television and new media. Are they comparable or complementary? Media industry players give perspective on the trends, progress, challenges, and the way forward. Find out on this compelling edition of TV Guide. Expository interviews with stars of the team within our space. Becky Madajemo of NTA, Dibel More of AIT, Nifemi Ogunfe of TC, and a host of others. TV Guide, your indispensable companion. Also feature Yamadina. TV drama series on NTA. Let's get to meet the characters behind Yam Dina. This edition also presents exciting features on tourism, culture, entertainment, sports, health, and lots more. Grab a copy at the vendors near you or any NTA state nationwide. TV Guide, your indispensable companion. Enjoy more data than before on Airtel Home Broadband. Get up to 160 gigabytes on routers with 25,000 Naira and 55 gigabytes on Airtel MiFi's with 12,000 Naira. More data, more you. Reliable Home Broadband by Airtel, the smartphone network. <laughs> Their ancestors were taken away as slaves. Now, they return as kings and queens on a pilgrimage back to the motherland. The third door of return ceremony, the Aspera Festival Badagri, Lagos, Nigeria, takes place in Badagri from the 15th to the 20th of October, 2019. <laughs> Details on participation in sponsorship, contact the following. Website, adore.ng. The African Door of Return Experience. Don't miss it. Brought to you by the African Door of Return Experience Initiative in collaboration with the Nigerian Diaspora Commission and the African Renaissance Foundation. Chief host, the Lagos State Government. Choose Dano Milk for your family because 100% of our milk is sourced from our farms. This means that we control the entire production process from grass to glass, taking great care in every step to ensure the milk that gets to you is of high quality. Great tasting and enriched with essential nutrients that are great for your family. So build your strength every day with the goodness of Dano Milk. Available in Dano Cool Cow, Dano Full Cream, Dano Slim, and Dano Flavored Milk. History was made in Africa with the birth of the first television station, WNTV, in Ibadan, Nigeria, on October 31, 1959. I have great pleasure in formally launching Western Nigeria Television, first in Africa.
Television in Africa clocked 60 this year. It's time to celebrate this remarkable achievement. Various activities are lined up. Photo exhibition, a colloquium, public presentation of broadcasting books, and a gala night. Be part of these events powered by Foundation for Ibado Television Anniversary Celebrations, FITAC. Well, this is Good Morning Nigeria, in case uh, you just uh, joined us. Now, let's go business. The Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, grants Nigeria a higher oil output. Details of this and more with Comfort Amodu. The Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, granted Nigeria a higher oil output target under an OPEC-led deal with the location of 1.774 million barrels per day from 1.685 million barrels per day. In view of this, OPEC says Nigeria will see an improvement in its compliance with the supply cut. Meanwhile, the World Bank has caught its economic growth focus for sub-Saharan Africa for 2019 to 2021 by 0.2 percentage points from its earlier projection citing a slowdown in fixed investment and policy uncertainty in the global economy. Nigeria's economy is expected to grow 2.0 percent this year compared with the previous forecast of 2.1 percent in April and to expand 2.1 percent in 2020 and 2021 which are 0.1 and 0.3 percentage points lower than the April forecasts, while South Africa's economy will expand 0.8% from a 1.3% forecast in April and growth will rise to 1.0% in 2020 from the bank's April forecast of 1.7%. And as the 25th edition of the Nigerian Economic Summit ends in Abuja, the federal government says the task of transforming the economy is huge, as the risks are high but with opportunities that are many. Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning Zainab Ahmed stated this while declaring the summit closed with an assurance that reports and recommendations of the summit will receive adequate attention. And next is the closing figures of trading activities on the floor of the Nigerian Stock Exchange where investors lost 102.71 billion naira as the market dipped by minus 0.79%. With business news, comfort, Amadou. Thank you very much, comfort, for the business package on Good Morning Nigeria. Next for us, we'll take a look at uh, the front pages of the papers we have this morning. And Bayo Atayebi, uh, newspaper reviewer, has just uh, joined us. Uh, Bayo, good morning and welcome. Thank you, Kerry. Good morning. Good morning, Kinsley. Yeah. Good Bayo. morning, Nigeria. Yeah, Bayo, good to see you. Daily right. uh, uh, Sun. Yeah. Le let's uh, begin with Daily Sun. Daily Sun newspaper. Uh, on the uh, right-hand side of, of, the of the name plate, we have a 2020 budget. Senators knock Buhari's projections. With the writer, fight insecurity, hardship with appropriation, can, tells Buhari. The story can be found on pages 6 and 41. Now, top to bottom, let's get to the list story. 30,000 naira wage. Federal government moves to prevent workers' strike. Minister holds emergency meeting with labor leaders. That's on page 6. Uh, the other uh, story is... Uh, on this page, of course, uh, besides the uh, uh, photo story here, 
President sends, sets agenda for Economic Council, makes case for homegrown solutions to economic problems. That's on page 8. Corruption. ICPC police plan joint tank operation against security officers. It's on page 4. EFCC recovers money in INEC Zamfara office. Below that, sex for admission. Unilag raises panel to try lecturers. That's on page 40. As welcomes reports on cases of members, ethical prof uh, professional misconduct. Yeah, that's all, Kinsley. Uh, okay, yeah. all right. Let's take a look at the front page of uh, the Punch newspaper. Um, well, let's just go from above the nameplate right down to the foot of the front page. So above the nameplate of Punch, uh, we have this headline. Nigeria demands $62 billion from IOCs as unpaid profits. That's on page 34. IOC stands for International Oil Companies or Oil Corporations. So Nigeria demands $62 billion from IOCs as unpaid profits. Minimum wage deadline. Labor mobilizes for strike. Federal government counters move. That's page two. Now, federal government pays P and ID £250,000 court ordered cost. Details on page 20. Two earpieces uh, beside the nameplate ASU opens peace talks with breakaway group. That's on page eight. And Senate proposes five year jail term for school sexual offenders. That's on page 20. Late stories on the budget National Assembly, LCCI. SCCI is Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and experts knock federal government's 2020 budget. With two riders, funding challenges imminent, according to professionals, and Senate and reps begin debate on document. Details of the story can be found on page 31. Now, there's a photograph there on the front page of the Punch newspaper with the caption, suspected kidnappers and armed robbers during their parade in Kaduna on Wednesday. You can see they are, most of them there are in military fatigue. Uh, you see them there along, of course, with the, the assortment of uh, weapons that they have and uh, some of the ammunition recovered from them. Uh, or your anti-grazing bill uh, to punish poor herders, according to Fulani, details on page eight. EFCC arrests suspected froster in presidential villa environs. That's on page 44. Abuja IDP camp records 150 births in five years. That's page 41. And 21, I'm sorry, rather, 2.1 billion Naira fraud. Court extends Mena and Sons detention. Details can be found on page 10. And uh, lastly, fire me once Senate scrapped an Oronsaya report implemented. Details on page 34. Bio. Well, let's start with the, the story about uh, Kaduna, where the Commissioner of Police, Ali Yanga, uh, paraded uh, some arrested suspects, about 50 of them, in, uh, in activities including kidnapping, armed, rob uh, armed banditry, cattle rostering, rape, and of course, culpable homicide. Uh, in the first instance, the police command paraded the alleged killer of the commandant of the Jaji Command Secondary School. The commissioner of police said the 36 uh, year old suspect is a teacher and he alleged he raped the naval officer before killing her. Uh, but the teacher paraded says that no, he acted alone and did not rape, rape the naval officer. He, however, said that he engaged in he uh, entered the house and hit the officer with an iron rod on the head. He said that he killed her for cheating staff at the command secondary school. He alleges that the, there are some financial benefits that ought to accrue to staff, which he denied them. The man alleges that he was denied, for instance, 100,000. Was that sufficient enough to take another person's life? Uh, the commissioner of police also said that 20 AK-47 rifles, including three Beretta uh, pistols, locally made guns, were recovered from criminals. Some of those that were, were paraded include those who were terrorizing uh, commuters on the Abuja Kaduna Highway. They include kidnappers of the three students of uh, Amadou Bello University, as well as a member of Kaduna State House of Assembly. Others that were paraded included uh, the persons who uh, kidnapped Sheikh Ahmed uh, Al-Karani and also the killers of the 
three operatives of the Inspector of General Police Intelligence Response Team in 2018. The command says that it is up and doing and has indeed followed up with the six students of Engrave that had been uh, kidnapped as well as the two staff and they are already in contact with them and they are negotiating. On the running story relating to the sex scandal in the universities, the authorities of University of Lagos has instituted a panel to probe allegations of sexual harassment leveled against two of its lecturers. Uh, the, one, of the, one is at the Department of European Studies, while the other is of the Department of Economics. Presently, they have been barred from coming to the academic environment. The panel is headed by the Dean of the Faculty of Law, who is also a professor uh, of law. The university assures students, staff, alumni, parents, and guardians that the scandal will be uh, traced and every sense of responsibility with all seriousness that it deserves. He says that the university is embarrassed and is ready to redeem its image. Meanwhile, the Academic Stars Union of the Unilag has also condemned the, in all forms of unethical practices, including sexual harassment, and they have enjoined members of the uh, community to report any unethical or unprofessional conduct to its members and the Academic Staff Union will deal, will deal with it uh, seriously. Meanwhile, the Senate at its uh, preliminary yesterday uh, revisited the sexual harassment bill that was passed by the 8th National Assembly. Uh, this time around, it was revived by the, the Deputy Senate President, uh, uh, Senator V. Omar Agege. And the, the bill, as proposed, is uh, expected to have uh, an offense, make an offense of anybody, if he or a she, that. Uh, have any casual uh, canal knowledge with any student of less than 18 years or above and demand sex from any student or any one uh, prospecting student that is looking for admission that is so ex exploited. It is proposed there in uh, an imprisonment of five years and a fine of five million. Yeah. Okay, yeah, but there are other stories. Thanks, I mean, for the analysis that you have provided so far. Um, of course, we're taking out the budget again in our conversation segment uh, yes. uh, later on in the program. Mm -hmm. The uh, panel already set up by the University of Lagos is most welcome. The panel is headed by Professor Ayo Ashenua. Um, she's a very thorough and uh, diligent uh, academic. I mean, she's uh, taught mm -hmm. constitutional law, taught human rights, and I think aspects of criminal law in the past. Uh, so she's, she's a very thorough person, and I'm sure that uh, the stakeholders, as, as the saying goes, will be uh, on the lookout for the outcome of the of the investigations. But one thing that I, I believe I don't know whether that's part of the mandate mm. uh, of of the panel at the University of Lagos. Other institutions could also uh, endeavour, you know, to find out whether any such thing existed. That's the so-called code room where. Uh, some of these uh, incidents, you know, were said to have been actualized, the incidents of harassment and so on and so forth. Now, it turns out that perhaps you know, the lecturer who was caught on the, on the video, you know, in the documentary is probably one of several others. How did the code room function? You know, what, who were those? Who were those that were there in the past? Yes. Uh, what information? You know, how? Just, just how did it function? Because the school has closed it down, but is there any guarantee that it might not be reopened? And then you have other activities going on. So you want to shut it down permanently? Mm. Shut it down for all times. And as it is at the moment, it's, it's not just uh, the, 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 the the young man, mm. the first man. There's another person. That's right. And the investigations are on again to track others because if it's a cold room that's operated by senior lecturers. Of course, it cannot be one or two. Absolutely, <laughs> yes. that's right. The cool room actually is a room in the staff club, and it is provided with dim light, like a disco kind of environment. Exactly. And that is where the atrocities, according to that uh, video clip of the BBCI mm -hmm. uh, that has been featured. But the university has reacted by closing the so-called cold room. But let's see what comes out. But presently, many students have been encouraged to come, and some former students, too, are beginning to talk especially those who have been victims mm -hmm. of such yes. uh, uh, overtures. And it's not only limited to University of Lagos. Across the nation, many universities and uh, other graduates have had such uh, instances. And there's this allegation that there are several who have graduated uh, that uh, probably are called sex-induced graduates uh, who have been awarded 
degree is that they don't merit, but through some of these uh, untoward uh, contacts. Yeah, as, as, it, some students are, are left uh, are, are left ungraduated for several years. Some of right. them, that's some of them, they, they have left school. Yeah, but there are some courses that yeah. are still holding them back. That cannot graduate properly because they, 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 those courses are, you know, and these are some of the, you know, consequences of uh, what uh, these lecturers do. And it's, it's pervasive. It's not the fact. Uh, if I uh, well, would not be so uh, pessimistic, but I know that uh, it is. Um, in most tertiary institutions in Nigeria. Yes, such acts go on clandestinely, and uh, it's good that it's come to the fore, and already universities are dealing with it. Ife is dealing with his own. Amadu Bello University mm -hmm. is now legal stuff. <coughs> Others will now see that, well, if your brother's beard has catch fire, you better rub water on your own. That is yeah. what is likely yeah, to happen. And perhaps, uh, if, if uh, one may say it, one of the most uh, unfortunate and irresponsible statements uh, to be made and circulated on social media it came from uh, a lecturer in one of the universities. You know, you were talking about students who don't merit their degrees. Uh, the, student, the lecturer was seeking to justify it by saying that some stu female students will prefer to have a what, according to him, is sexually transmitted degree. Greece. You know, <laughs> trivializing a very serious matter of this nature. Mm. I'm not sure he has daughters. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> well, All right. The, the okay. other story that yesterday caught my attention um, in, among the papers is why President Muhammad Buhari called for appreciation of the historical relationship among communities to sustain our national unity. Uh, he was saying this when the, the, the traditional council of Benue State, led by the Tortif, uh, Professor James Advasi, uh, visited him. And he was referring to uh, what is described as cultural place. Uh, within some uh, cultures within this country, you have such cultural place. For instance, anywhere a TV man sees a full animal, they are automatically, automatically friends. Uh, I was a youth copper in my degree when my colleague, who is a thief man, were going and he shouted at the Fulani man and said, Fulani, come here. The Fulani man turned and said, this must be a munchie man. Mm -hmm. And he came and they embraced. They've never known anybody any from, uh, they've never met before. It's the first time. But it is the tradition. Uh, the history has it that uh, the Fulani kept his cows for custody with the thief. And when the Fulani came back, he asked for his uh, cattle, and the thief said, Munchi, we have eaten it. And so the Fulani man always called the thief man Munchi. Mm. And it also happens in, up north, uh, between the Nupe and the Kasina. The Nupe man will say he is the master of the man from Kasina. <laughs> I don't know if the, uh, for instance, the Esu Nupe will say he's the master of everybody in Kasina, including Mr. President. I don't know whether that uh, cultural play <laughs> yes. extends to the <laughs> descendants of, of Daurama. <laughs> but even, even the Northern Yorubas too, they have this play with the Gobirawas that they are the masters of the people from Gobir. Mm. And these are the kind of connections that helps weld the bonds of friendship and brotherhood in the nation. And the president was emphasizing that. Uh, that should be strengthened. And the Tortif actually happened it and said, uh, we, the thief, will want to have on the opportunity of our brother Fulani there to demand for some uh, goodies uh, of yeah. dividends of democracy. That's a good one. That's yeah. a good one. Yeah. We, 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 you know, we discussed this some days ago when we saw the story earlier. Asu is opening peace talks with the breakaway group. <laughs> Let's not go there now. Why, why, why would you? Why would no, you? No, do no, that? Why would you? Because because if we begin to analyze that, you know, that would take us uh, some so, so more time. But it, it is the head of development actually, the head of development, because it's going to address this issue of uh, incessant uh, you know, strikes uh, in, in the country. Okay, now let's go to the editorial for today, which is on on health matters. The health scare at Queens College, Lagos. Uh, it's an editorial opinion from the Daily Trust newspaper. Uh, the report goes, now, it says that uh, an infection at Queen's College, Lagos, um, unnerved many Nigerians, especially parents of the college's students. The latest incident occurred just two weeks after the students resumed uh, for a fresh academic session, and it came barely two years after a similar incident uh, in, the, in the same school. And uh, just one other line before we go to Bayer, uh, while reviewing the investigation team's report, the health commissioner, the Lagos Health Commissioner, said the surveillance team identified what appears to be a sporadic increase in upper respiratory tract infections characterized by cough, catarrh, fever, and weakness uh, across some schools in Lagos. That is to say, not just uh, Queen's College. Okay. For, well, the alarm, the alarm bell got rang just two weeks after the student resumed for this current uh, 
academic session. Uh, and it is not far-fetched because two years back, we have lost three students at Queen's College, and therefore parents were alarmed. And not only that, a student had inundated the school clinic. All of them complained. About 79 students had gone there to complain. And the symptoms are what you just described, uh, cough, catar, mm. fever, and weakness. And this can be symptoms of uh, viral infection, malaria, several other uh, ailments. But, but why to is play, so pervasive? Why are many students getting it at the same to time? Play, to play safe, uh, there was an investigation team, and it has been investigated, and they said that the environmental situation of the college is okay, but it can be improved upon. But the concern of the Commissioner of Health for Lagos State is that uh, both the federal government, the Queen's College, and Lagos State uh, Ministry of Health are working on it to uh, try to identify what the causes are. It's basically an environmental thing. And I am emphasizing that because Queen's College is one of the oldest schools in the country, and probably uh, age and some of the infrastructure are a factor. But they are trying to get their hands on it. But they have also advised that we, as we were doing the, during the time of Ebola, people should resort to hand washing and using sanitizers to be, to be careful because it's basically an environmental thing. Uh, 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 right. time last week, you know, we discussed uh, this yeah, issue right. of uh, with, with the, the situation at... Uh, um, but, but, but what was significant... Um, I mean, it's, after the story broke and a lot of commentaries, including analysis by Bio, and it's a part review segment, the uh, permanent secretary, the Minister of Health, Federal Minister of Health, mm -hmm. was there. The Lagos State Commissioner for Health was also there. So, uh, I mean, the, uh, the response by the health authorities is one that uh, should, be, should be commended. Uh, so we, we do hope that they will take care of whatever environmental issues, uh, causative factors in what has been the uh, outbreak of, uh, of those illnesses. Bye, Toyebi. Thanks a lot for being Thank around. Thank you, too. We'll see you again tomorrow. Okay, it's Good Morning Nigeria on the Network Service of the NTA. We'll take a short break now. When we return, we'll be discussing the 2020 Appropriation Bill, Part 2. NTA Abelkuta is 40. Come, let's celebrate 40 years of impressive TV broadcasting at the grassroots. On Thursday, 17th, October 2019, there'll be a lecture titled Lens and Sound, Television, a tool for social reorientation and good governance. Guest lecturer, Professor Oluyemisi Oluremi Obiladi, Professor of Education and Women's Studies, Obafemi Awolo University. Special guest of honor, His Excellency, Prince Dakwa Abiodun, Governor of Ogun State. Royal Father of the Day, His Royal Majesty, Oba Adedotunare Mubadebo, the Alake and Pramontrola of Egbaland. Chairman of the occasion, Chief Olatunde Anyela Abudu, Mayego of Egbaland. Chief Host, Malam Yakubu Ibn Mohammed, Director General, NCA. Other activities lined up for the occasion include an array of awards to distinguished entities, held to walk on Saturday, 12th October 2019, while a novelty match comes up on Tuesday, 15th October 2019 at MKO Abiola Stadium. Come, celebrate 40 years of impressive television at the grassroots with us and take NCA Abelko to the next level. <laughs> They are there at the crack of dawn. They are there busy preparing while we rise for our day. They are there silently, guarding, waiting, listening, and watching. They are there ready in the sky above and the waters below, in the blistering heat of the day, in the dead of night, willing, indefatigable, determined in the defense of the sovereignty of our country. They are our first line of defense and our last. They who have paid the ultimate price in defending us. They are fathers and uncles. They are mothers and sisters and girlfriends and boyfriends. They are brothers and cousins and best friends and neighbors. They are classmates, colleagues and citizens of this nation. They are our defenders and deserve our respect, our prayers, our thoughts. Nigeria, please support our armed forces. succeeded to pull a galaxy of stars from the north, south, east to the west, and central Africa, and also those that are domiciled beyond the shores of Africa, under one roof.
Film editing and television production techniques are wonders of the tube that you get with continuous training and retraining. NTA Television College Joss therefore invites film editors and producers in public and private television stations to a special four-week intensive course on film editing and basic television production. Date. 14th October to 8th November 2019. Course fee, 100,000 Naira per participant. Accommodation inclusive. Venue, NTA TV College, Rayfield Jaws. Take advantage of the course to upgrade your professional skills in film editing and television production. For inquiries, please call 0803-314-4383 or 0806-980-9807. NTA TV College, Jaws. Training you to be the best you want to be. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Please, did you hear that? Uh, of course I did. That is village and master tomb. Yeah. So, Auntie Amebo was not gossiping then? Village and master is celebrating 50 years. 50? Already? Wait, oh, you mean people have been watching village and master since 1968? How time flies. I have retired, but not tired. And I'm 50 years now. So because of that, we won't get big party. New date, now 28th to 29th, October 2019. And me, I'm a body invite you now. I'm a belly just the sweet. Because I don't say all those people, they drink my party. Then go, come, come drink the tombo again. And me, radio and jam, they call you now. They could not forget it. And uh, we're glad to welcome you back to the program. And now to the second phase of our discussion on the 2020 appropriation bill. First, let's take excerpts of uh, previous speakers on the subject matter put together by Victor Azu. Imagine a budget of 10.3 trillion naira and in that budget, only 2.1 trillion naira will be spent on capital expenditure. In a developing economy like Nigeria, this is a bit of an abnormality. Most serious is the debt service. We spent 2.45 billion, which is uh, I mean trillion, which is much more than capital expenditure. And if we continue accumulating, I mean uh, producing a deficit budget that will further you know, aggravate the uh, external debt. Certainly, in the next coming years, we'll be, we'll be paying trillions more in debt servicing this debt. I think the president has a natural instinct to protect the poor. Any addition of a cobble on, on the Nigerian poor is a burden. So what the president has done is to exclude principally all food items. From, from the VATs, from this new proposed VAT uh, amendments. All food items, bread, up to gari, <laughs> and, and all that, so that the, the poor man is protected. I would uh, suggest that the National Assembly should look critically at the non-debt component of the budget to see areas of possible duplication, areas of possible wastages, you know, that can be eliminated from the budget. All right, now those uh, were excerpts from the guest that we had yesterday, in the first part of our discussion on the 2020 appropriation bill tabled by President Mamadou Buhari before the joint session of the National Assembly on Tuesday this week. Now we have guests with us here in the studios as well as at our Cardinal Network Center to provide their own perspectives on the issues. First, let's welcome Honorable Babangida Ibrahim. Honorable Babangida Ibrahim is the current chairman of the House Committee on Capital Markets and Institutions. Pleasure to have you with us. Thank on the you, sir. Uh, also here with us uh, is our regular uh, economic analyst, uh, Dr. Emeka Okengo, who is a development economist. Dr. Okengo, pleasure to have you again. It's an honor to be here. Nigeria. Good morning, Nigeria. Uh, all right. And uh, joining us uh, for the conversation from our Kaduna studio is uh, 
Well, Yishao Ango, uh, actually, uh, he's a uh, guest in Kaduna, but uh, when the, the coast is clear, um, we will we'll be able to, to join him. All right, now, he is uh, on the line now, and uh, let's once again welcome to the program uh, Associate Professor uh, Yishao Ango, Dean Post Graduate School, Kaduna State University. Thank you for joining us this morning on the program. Good morning. All right, Kinsley, uh, gentlemen, yeah. you are, you're welcome. And uh, this is the second stanza of our conversation on uh, budget 2020 as presented by the president to the National Assembly. You just watched the excerpts from our guests yesterday on this uh, subject matter. And uh, for your own perspective, let's begin with uh, America Okingo. Thank you very much. I, I think we'll let, let's, let's, uh, let's do a little swat what you call, you know, strength, uh, weakness, opportunities and threats of uh, that presentation. Let's start with strength. Beautifully prepared document, uh, timely presented, and we must give kudos to both the executive and the National Assembly. Uh, it is just now that you have prepared a beautiful document. It's also now for the first time being timelined. And this is the first time in a long time you're seeing the National Assembly actually bring out a calendar of events of how they intend to deal with our budget. Having said that, let us also now recognize that it is what it is. It is a financial plan that you have cast in figures. So it is not all about that beautiful, well-prepared document. It is for us to now be able to now look at where and where we might be able to find what you call the weaknesses and the threats. And a lot of it you know, are also captured in the document. Uh, the president was you know, uh, frank and fair enough you know, to to also mention some of his weaknesses. First, he talked about uh, the global you know, economic meltdown. He talked about the local challenges we have. And then most of all, he also talked about uh, the focus on being able to generate revenue. Because remember, the budget as a plan can only become functional when you now have what you call a consistent revenue inflow. So if you don't have revenue against all those beautiful plans you have, it's not going to work. So for me, I would say that yes, it's a beautiful document, well documented, well put together, but we must be able to now just oppose this beauty against what you might call the fault lines. Fault line number one <coughs> will be the position of the National Assembly on the MTEF. Fault line number two will be you know, against the revenue projections of 8 point something trillion. Uh, in the past, what have we been able to get as revenue generations? Fault line number three, will now be the focus of what you call your critical infrastructure, all right, as against what you call your social infrastructure. Fault line number four will now be, you know, what you call your implementation strategy. Are you able to now build the required synergies? Okay, because right now, allocations have been made, you know, as it were, uh, on silo basis. Power has its own allocation. Uh, uh, works and housing has its own. Education is broken into two. You now have universal uh, primary education having about a hundred and something a billion. And then you have agriculture, you have water resources. How are we able against the facts or known facts that we might not be able to now meet these revenue streams to be able to now make certain that these things are implemented fully? How are we able to now build what you call very strong synergies? Okay, and then decouple this expenditure and then identify probably three broad sectors of implementation. One, those sectors that you will call fundamental and foundational. Two, those sectors that you will now call the support, you know, infrastructure support sectors. Eh? And then three, those sectors you will now call your revenue, you know, generating, you know, sectors. And against all, how are we able to get Nigerians to contribute on a sustainable basis to the income stream that will be helping to drive you know, this uh, budget. I, I think as we go <coughs> along, I'll be able to now throw my more highlights on it. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Emeka Okengo. Let's uh, go over to our Kaduna Network Studios, uh, where we are introduce Associate Professor uh, Yushua Ango, who is uh, of the Kaduna State University, who is the Dean of School of Postgraduate Studies. Associate Prof, let's have your take on the broad outlines of the appropriation bill. Yes, I think the budget, uh, from my understanding, um, clearly is a budget uh, that is um, 
probably proposed uh, in consideration of our uh, situation. This is a country that was um, uh, that faced some challenges and had recession at a point, and uh, we're happy that uh, we have been out of recession now for nine quarters. Uh, it has the budget has also brought out the growth that we have witnessed in the various quarters and the various years, and um, the target globally and the target within the sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, the way we are growing or we propose to grow uh, is so that we have not been able to meet up with the overall, so even sub-Saharan African target, but is progressing nonetheless uh, accordingly. Uh, clearly, what the budget has in terms of um, uh, the total amount that is supposed to be spent, vis-a-vis -vis the total revenue that is expected to be generated is a matter uh, that shows that we have, um, there is a need, there is a need to drive revenue, uh, you know, for this country. Uh, as a country that is growing in population uh, over these years, uh, uh, we also have challenges, serious challenge uh, to generate uh, revenue. Now, of course, one of the things or the measures taken or rather, since even the implementation of the economic uh, plans of this administration uh, has been to improve revenue from the perspective of non-oil sector, and even this budget has shown that the non-oil sector will provide a lot more revenue expected, more than the, uh, the oil sector. But obviously, I mean, we have a challenge of growing our revenue, and without growing our revenue, we will not be able to do what we need to do, which is to grow and develop our infrastructure, you know, uh, and all that. So there is a challenge, and I'm happy that the economic team uh, so, uh, recently uh, established has met with the president, and I hope one of the things they will come, about, uh, come out with, in addition to uh, fighting the issues of poverty uh, in Nigeria, uh, should be a lot on how we can generate revenue without putting much um, uh, pain on the populace, but and then also how to develop our infrastructure. I think those are the challenges uh, which came out. There is a challenge of revenue uh, generation. We are growing, especially in the non-oil sector, but I think uh, it's still a challenge. Okay, well, we'll certainly uh, return to you in due course. Uh, now back to Abuja where we have uh, uh, Honorable Babangida Ibrahim. Uh, Babangida Ibrahim, of course, is the chairman of the uh, House Committee on Capital Market and Institutions. Now, uh, you, you have a, a huge job in your hands, uh, you know, presently. And uh, considering your position as the Chairman of Capital Market and Institutions, you are certainly going to play a, a big role in uh, doing the, the rest of the job remaining uh, with respect to the 2020 budget that they're uh, trying to do the, uh, the scrutiny and uh, of course uh, do your own adjustments uh, to return to the president for uh, ascension to uh, uh, into law now what is it for you in that budget you were there at the presentation what is it for you what are the you know uh, the, the tipping points you know or, or those uh, 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 striking aspects of, of the budget well uh let me start by saying that, uh, you know, the medium term expenditure framework is the basis upon which the budget is prepared. And uh, the parameters are presented uh, on MTEP, that the benchmark, the crude price, and uh, the exchange rates, production. Uh, government this time around try as much as possible to be realistic. Because the average production uh, in the 2019 performance up to September, August, has is about 1.87 trillion. And uh, the production uh, was 2.3 in 2019, and uh, it was brought down to 2.18 uh, trillion. Uh, taking into consideration that uh, uh, we are likely to meet it. You see, in the National Assembly, any time those documents are presented to us, we try to as much as possible to invite the executive arms, those agencies that are responsible for those areas, to come and brief us how realistic is it. And in most cases, they give us the hope 
that uh, taking into consideration some of the measures they put in place, you'll be able to get off. If you notice, the exchange rate has been there for over five years. It's always 305, 305, 305. We don't have much concern uh, with the exchange rate because it's mostly used for combustion purposes. So what I'm saying is that uh, the budget of our 10 trillion uh, was what the government planned to do. Uh, if, you look at, if you look at the main stay of the 2020 budget, the consolidation of the macroeconomy, foreign direct investments, improvement on social investment program, and uh, involving private partnership. Because if you have infrastructure decay, government alone cannot sustain and provide solution for infrastructure. So by, by engaging the private sector, I think it will go a long way in mitigating the challenges we have with infrastructure. And uh, another very important issue that uh, has to do with the budget is this increase on the, uh, the BET, which uh, they want to increase from 5 to 7.5 percent. And uh, the surplus front, that increase is targeted in enhancing some of the uh, deficit areas of the budget. But uh, there are some critical and most important things that we have to be on the watch, which the National Assembly are going to look at it during the debate. The threshold on the 25 million uh, uh, turnover. Because uh, I keep wondering, you see, BAT is a consumption tax. Now, if you are putting a threshold on companies, at what point at the market level will you determine which company provides what and for what? It's going to be absolutely very difficult. And this area, I think, uh, we are going to organize a public uh, hearing on the finance bill. And uh, this is a very important area that we have to look at because if company A has a turnover of 30 million, company B has a turnover of 18 million, and up or some are providing taxable items. And those taxable items are consumptions. The people consume them and they go to the same markets. Now, at what point do you segregate which product is provided for a company that has a turnover of less than 25 and above 25? It's going to be almost impossible to implement that aspect. And uh, during the public hearing, we'll listen to them while they put the threshold and uh, we, we, we see whether it's going to be possible or not. Okay, Honorable uh, Ibrahim, thank you very much. Kiran, you know, yesterday you recall the uh, VAT threshold was one of the issues that our guest also uh, uh, talked about. I mean, the, the nature, first of all, uh, there is need to go back. I'm sure you take that into consideration during in the course of your public hearings. The real nature of, of VAT, value added tax, and whether the threshold now provided for exemption being 25 million euro as a turnover of a company, is being camouflaged perhaps as uh, comp company's income tax or otherwise. So those are issues that you worry about. Let's return to America or Kengo. You, you already outlined, you know, some of, shall we say, the red flags. Earlier you talked about the position of the National Assembly on, M on, on the MTEP, that's the Medium Term Expenditure Framework, uh, plus uh, other issues. Let's get some of the details from what you earlier highlighted. Okay, you know, like I said, it, it's important that when you are looking at a document, you look at it from two broad perspectives, okay? Uh, a, a budget is a generic document as it were. Uh, most of the times you have what you call, you know, uh, your windows or your envelopes. So all you need to do is to be able to put into those envelopes and then you now begin to now just oppose it against your revenue stream. Uh, what is most important for us to be looking at is if we say, we are going to be spending 2.4 million on capital infrastructure. What infrastructure are we talking about? Are this infrastructure that are going to be social infrastructure? Are this infrastructure going to be critical infrastructure? And what is the difference between social infrastructure and critical infrastructure? Okay, to the man probably in uh, my Malari village in Sokoto, okay, a, a hospital might be critical infrastructure. To somebody who is in Abuja, who have or who has alternatives, a hospital might be social infrastructure. So in trying to now define what it is that can be able to unlock this budget, and we are talking about revenue streams, I just want to give you a typical example. A lot of us have forgotten that there was an organization called the PTF in this country 
that was actually any more money on a daily basis than government. What was PTF doing? It was just a policy statement to say this is the amount that is coming in as landing cost of fuel. And government was going to be adding three naira on top of it. And every Nigerian who was buying petrol was paying that tax. That was very innovative. And then just based on the fact that everybody now contributed to, be, to the PTF, a lot of revenue came. And I stand to be corrected. I do not think that there has been any government or that has spent as much on infrastructure as that fund did. Just one fund. So if we're looking at this budget and government says to you, we are cash trapped, you don't even need government to say that, Kingsley. We are cash trapped. Okay? And then you have a debt service overhang of over two point, you know, four trillion already on your head. And you have a deficit eh, of over two trillion already on your head. And you now have an income stream that you're going to be projecting against something you know that is very dicey right now. And we are not even now talking about looking at this, our, you know, uh, valorization production model that was practiced for a very long time. And they were looking at, okay, when we talk about VAT, each time people talk about VAT, I say to them, can we give an elementary meaning to VAT? Value added tax. Now, what are you value adding? Most of the things that we now use to now calculate our taxes are actually final products of other people that we buy as raw materials, okay? I'll give another typical example here. There is a small fund that they call the Solid Minerals Development Fund, okay? Now, what are they supposed to be doing? They are supposed to be going to now look for projects in the solid mineral sector. Yobe is classified as one of the poorest states in Nigeria. However, take this and take it to the bank. In Yobe, there is 900 million metric tons of bentonic clay. 900 million. And do you know what bentonic clay is? It is a major ingredient for drilling mud. Now imagine if government gives a matching order eh, to that small fund to say, you know what it is you're going to be doing? Part of what we want you to do as this fund is that you must be able to get 30% to 40% of that income eh, coming in to be able to now support our revenue stream. Another example, so I don't take a lot of time. I do a lot of road trips. Everybody thinks that the Cocoa Belt is in Western Nigeria. You'll be shocked that from Lokoja until you get to Enugu, the Cocoa Pods that you see on the roads are as big as Popo. Now, and do you know what it is? In that whole stretch of road, all you see are little subsistence pedestrian farmers. Imagine a situation where we also now have an agricultural program. And I'm talking about critical infrastructure now to be able to now support what it is we're talking about. So in us trying to get out of this, government has said we are not going to be employing more people. That's what the president has said. He also says you must create jobs for 10 million people. Now, to some other person, it sounds like a paradox, isn't it? But what I think the president is technically saying is, you must be able to get this project to support the private sector. Now, this is where, again, another challenge comes. Where is the private sector? Where is the real sector? How does these projections or allocations that we have, probably 20 30%, are we able to now use it to now support this creation of 10 million jobs? So in all, the major fault line of this budget will be for us not to understand that any wrong expenditure that is not linked, okay, to now being able to now develop what you call demand-driven and resort-oriented infrastructure eh, programs and outputs would be pouring water down a long drain. Okay, I, 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 I think okay. Kieran, I'll just, I'll just, I know that yes, I bet yeah. you, you want to uh, take over. The issue of cocoa that you raised, cited as an example, yes. uh, it was talking about, you know, some people having the misperception that, uh, which is, uh, cocoa belt is mostly in the western part of the yeah. country. I, I'm not sure what the latest figures are, but between Ondo and Cross River State, you have the leading cocoa producing state in the Federation. Mm -hmm. And coming third will be a Edo State. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, you have all, all the other states. So it's, it's an entire bed. Mm -hmm. But the point you, you made in terms of 
dealing with the value chain in our cocoa production is very significant. It is. Mm. It is indeed. I think the, 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 the most crucial aspect of this conversation uh, with respect to the 2020 budget is the aspect of uh, revenue generation, internally generated revenue that we use to uh, actually uh, implement the, the, the budget. And uh, let's go to uh, uh, Kaduda once again. You shall angle, you've listened to uh, Dr. Michael o o King and all the fault lines uh, that uh, he has raised. And uh, I would like you also to bear your mind on the issue of the VAT, the increase in VAT, because uh, um, Ibra Babangira Ibrahim also raised that as uh, one of the uh, very, very important issues that the National Assembly uh, in intends to look into properly you know, before uh, they finally uh, give a go-ahead. Now, what is your own consideration with respect to the slight increase from 5% to 7.5%? And in answering this question, I'd also I'd like, to like you to add uh, to that the issue of um, being in a position to achieve the uh, SDG goals, considering ourselves, of course, as a developing nation, it's very fundamental if we're going to address those um, aspects of uh, development that uh, the nation uh, deserves. I have listened to the Honorable Member, uh, especially I want to comment on the issue of um, uh, putting the threshold at 25 million companies that have turnover of 25 million and above. What I understand from that uh, pronouncement is that in terms of collection, in terms of effort from the uh, Federal Revenue Service and all that, they will focus more on companies who have turnover of more than 25 million naira. That means, that is not to say that uh, those companies or I mean, uh, agencies or wherever uh, that have turnover of less than uh, 25 million will be exempted. That is my own understanding. Now, as to uh, uh, the increase itself, I think sincerely, despite the fact that we, uh, yes, we have an economy uh, that has a preponderance of, the, of those who are, uh, have, uh, are living below poverty line, I think ours is probably one of the lowest VAT rates uh, globally at 5%. So certainly it's time uh, to increase it. And uh, two years ago or thereabout, I was in Dubai when they increased, they started VAT, they didn't have it at all, and they started with 10%. So uh, the same day also Saudi Arabia started with 10%. Uh, there is need to increase it. In any case, the out of whatever is collected, 85% or thereabout of it goes to the states and local governments, not the federal government. And the president in his statement specifically said whatever increase they have will be deployed towards um, health care, education, and so, uh, social investment program. So I think in that regard, uh, that is a very good uh, initiative. So there is need to increase the VAT, in my opinion, uh, because like I said earlier, we have a revenue challenge. Now with regards to the uh, what Dr. Imeka said also, uh, he made mention of some pockets of uh, funds, trust funds of various forms, and um, he mentioned one and there are others, I mean, the Education Trust Fund, for example, the Sugar Development Fund, and so many of them. What I don't know, and what is not very clear to me, and what is coming out is that a lot of what those funds are doing are not captured in the budgets. Uh, so in a way, quite a number of activities are taking place, and they are not captured in the budget. Now, we, the government has been able to bring every revenue as much as possible into the TSA. And I think also it's important that in budgeting for whatever, you know, from these various funds, their budget, whatever they plan to do, should also be brought under the ambit of somehow uh, a global overall uh, budget of the country, uh, you know, rather than for those funds to operate outside of the budget. There are also many other initiatives in terms of um, uh, uh, PPP initiatives. Uh, as part of the objective, of course, is to bring the private sector uh, to come into the uh, in, in terms of provision of infrastructure. I think wherever things have been concluded, uh, even if we are not using directly government funds to do some such projects, there is a way. I mean, it would be good for us if we can bring some of those initiatives also uh, into the kind of overall budget structure of the country, uh, rather than keeping those things outside of the budget. And uh, because, like, for example, you see a, a Federal Ministry of Education 
uh, having a budget of 40 something billion. Uh, and then, of course, if you go to TED Fund, you see the budget uh, is much more than that. UBEC has a budget of um, 100 and something billion. Now, when you look at the, whole, the educational sector and what it's required, and you see 40 something billion, uh, one would think that nothing is going to happen, not much is going to happen. But when you bring all the intervention agencies and funds, uh, whatever they're going to do in, then we'll probably have a better picture of what uh, the, the overall uh, development uh, trajectory is going to be in that sector of the, of the economy. So that is my, my take on this. Oh, okay, uh, Ishal Angle, thank you very much. We, we would like to uh, pursue further the issue that uh, you've just uh, uh, elaborated on, following from what Rebecca Okengu said. Now, uh, in the president's uh, presentation to the National Assembly, he did reference UBEC, which is Universal Basic Education Commission. Uh, that is also one of the special intervention uh, areas. But America Okengu has drawn our attention to the solid minerals. Uh, we also know that you have the Sugar Fund, you have the Petroleum Technology Development Fund, uh, and I'm sure there's one or two things concerning uh, series or rice and, and all of that. Honorable Babangeda Ibrahim, does the National Assembly have a full picture of these other funds that are, of course, spent according to law uh, as purposes, you know, for the overall development or economic growth of the country. Do you also capture all of that in it? You see, uh, it is very important to note that uh, we have what we call statutory cooperations. And statutory cooperations mostly are those agencies that by fiscal responsibility acts and by the act establishing them, they generate the revenue, they implement government policy, they have their mandate, and in doing so, at the end of the day, that's why they said they should provide a remit certain amount of operating surplus to the federal government according to the fiscal responsibility act. So what I'm saying is that, you see, a budget and government policy, they go hand in hand. If government has a policy on education, the budget on education will be tailored according to the government policy. And uh, when the president was making his presentation, specifically he has highlighted some of the area, key areas, where the government intend to focus in terms of 2020 fiscal year. You see, it is important for people to differentiate uh, distributable revenue, a revenue that is according to the federal government. You see, most of those revenues are distributable revenues. At the end of the day, the state has a stake, the local government has a stake, and the federal government has a stake. In preparing a federal government budget, federal government concentrate on what is expected as the percentage portion of the federal government, that's what is captured in the budget. So you see, and uh, when the president was making his presentation, clearly has mentioned the in intention of government to intensify our revenue generation. You see, uh, there are revenues where we have control and the revenues that we don't have control. For example, revenue from crude or sales of crude. In that aspect, the global market determines what happened in that area. When he was making his presentation, we had a drop in production from the targeted 2.3 to 1.87. But what complements that drop in production was the increase in the price of crude. We used $60 as benchmark, and the price rose to 67 So what I'm saying, in essence, is that, you see, most of statutory cooperations that have responsibility in various critical sectors of the economy, they are under our view. And uh, these are some of the areas that we also intend to focus in the Ninth Assembly to make sure that all revenues are accounted for. Well, Honorable Ibrahim, uh, I, I, I'm not talking strictly about statutory corporations uh, and how they're supposed to transmit their operating surpluses into uh, government coffers. We're talking about special funds created by law for instance, TED Fund, or Education Trust Fund, as it was known, it's 
two percent of companies' income uh, uh, profits, yeah, income, possible. income profits, uh, and then of course you also talked about. Uh, uh, solid minerals a, a while ago, and there is also PDTF. That's part of what Yushua was talking about, uh, and it could be misleading for analysts to assume that, oh, the figure announced by the president uh, while making his budgetary presentation on the allocation to education necessarily captures the receipts by all of these other funds that sugar, for instance, and, and, and all of that. Does the National Assembly have this universal picture? Yes, we do, because... We have various committees that are responsible in oversight of those agencies. Uh, part of the mandate of those committee is to look at the, the mandate of those agencies. How, how effective are the agencies implementing those mandates? Uh, if you notice that uh, even in the assembly, a lot of committees, other committees were raised in most cases on revenue or government. Because I remember one of the second ad hoc committee that was set up in the Ed Assembly was on revenue generation. All those agencies that had responsibility on generating revenue were brought and were scrutinized. This education tax, uh, education trust fund you are talking about, like you said clearly, is 2% of net profit of companies. And they go into the account and they hit the account and there's a committee that is responsible in ensuring that... Uh, those money are accounted for. If you look at UBEC, UBEC also is captured under the normal traditional budgets. Whatever is, 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 is said to UBEC, because most of those agencies, some of the MDAs, apart from the normal budgets, they also have the generate revenue which complement. Let me give you an example. This is an NTA. In addition of the budget of NTA, you also generate revenue. And the fiscal responsibility allows you to spend part of what you generated. So that's what is applicable to most of the agencies. Mm. And uh, that is the one of the primary functions of the National Assembly to conduct oversights. Oh, well, I'm okay. sorry, Dr. Okongo, do you have some clarity yes, on this I issue? Think, yes. I think what is important for us to do is to, like I said, we are doing a SWOT on this. The president had listed some weaknesses and also made some demands. And the primary demand the president made is that he wants this to be an inclusive budget. He wants an inclusion of everybody, social inclusion, financial inclusion. What that simply means is that we must be able to look at the way we've done things in the past. If we're not very careful, we will keep running this red tape. And then when people use the word red tapeism, they don't understand that that is what stifles government programs. For instance, the question will be, is there a relationship between the SMDF, which is called Solid Minerals Development Fund, and the Ministry of Defense in the Operations. Now, the answer will be, why would they be? But if you now deepen it to now go and start asking about the correct and stick question, now the correct and stick will be, is it possible for the SMDF to collaborate with the Ministry of Defense to open minds in these theaters of war? Okay, so that you can now begin to now get catchment areas that can be able to now absorb people who probably had gotten into this thing out of the frustration of no job. Now, another question will be, is there a relationship between the Ministry of Water Resources and the Sugar Council? Okay? Is there a relationship between the Ministry of Water Resources, the Sugar Council, and the Ministry of Lands, before you even now bring in the Ministry of Agriculture? Is there a relationship between the Ministry of Science and Technology in all these little things we're talking about? We're talking about inclusive growth. So if you don't understand it, and then you don't, you're not able to say to the SMDF, there has to be a synergy that is built around everybody here who are now the revenue generating agencies. To what extent are we able to support your operations with the budget of the line ministry? Okay, to what, able, to what extent are we able to now create a cooperation between you and these other people? Now, if you don't do that, let me tell you for me, the most important ministry in this country, if we're going to be building inclusive growth, and I'm very happy that the chairman is here, is the Ministry of Science and Technology. Something will shock you, that everything that supports agriculture is under the Ministry of Science and Technology. NABDA, okay, which is a major research agency, is under the Ministry of Science and Technology. The gamma irradiation uh, program we have is under the Ministry of Science and Technology. Raw Materials and Research Development Agency is under the Ministry of Science and Technology. Now, the question will be, my brothers, what is the collaborative efforts? What is the synergy? What is the interface? There won't be any. You know why? 
Because like Honorable says, there's a Fiscal Responsibility Act that cuts everybody's program out for him. Now, what this will do is that these agencies will take these capital projects, okay, put it on, onto ongoing projects, and a lot of them have uncompleted projects. And by the end of the budgetary season, you would have had a beautiful document that has not been able to achieve much. Remember in one of the administrations in the country, they now said, okay, we're going to now have a policy of insisting that every capital project must show a document eh, that produces 25% of jobs for Nigerians. How are you able to create this when you are not bringing these investments okay, to be able to now face policy, which is what we call business actually now facing policy? This is a major challenge we have as a country. Okay? I give you one very typical and resounding example. We talk about UBEC of being universal education. What is the relationship between UBEC and your centers, your trade centers? You and I grew up in the, in the days where anybody who had a trade test, eh, a certificate from a trade center, was more qualified than any engineer who had a degree from the university. You know why? Because what you get in the university is the theoretical aspect of engineering. What you get from those three centers, okay, are now the practical. That make the mechanics were all trained there. The artisans were all trained there. They were the skilled workforce. What is the relationship between you back, the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Science and Technology, and those trade centers? Beautiful. So if you're not able to build, if you're not able to build that, to understand that, you yes. see, Professor, we were, I don't know. Uh, we have to try as to be realistic as possible. Yes. You make an intervention agency. It doesn't matter. But you know, what I'm saying is that you see, we are trying to discuss 2020 budgets. Yes. You see, uh, I appreciate some of the challenges and issues he has been raising. But uh, most of them has to do with maybe challenges of improving the revenue. No, it has and to do with challenges of physical saying, discipline. See, because most of the relationships, mm -hmm. we are talking about solid minerals, the military, the UBEC, Ministry of Education, trade tests, and whatever. Mm -hmm. These are issues that are mostly are policies. And maybe uh, what I'm trying to say is that UBEC, as an is an intervention agency. They only intervene in the universities, tertiary oh, institutions, oh, 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 and all right. Oh, Honorable Bangla Ibrahim, yeah. I, I think that Michael Okengu raised the very pertinent issues. Yes, uh, you say, uh, you talked about uh, physical discipline. Some yeah. of these agencies we're talking about should work collaboratively, collaboratively to achieve an ultimate aim. If, for instance, we're talking about revenue generation and two agencies cannot team up to see how whatever uh, uh, act of, of law that established them, that, that they cannot work together, that cannot be a synergy, then nothing can be workable. Now, he mentioned a very, very crucial issue, which I raised yesterday, I remember, Kingsley, when yeah, I asked a question about science and technology, which is the driver of all forms of development. In fact, it, it, it is the alter ego, because there is no uh, 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 sector that does not require science technology and innovation. And somehow, the National Assembly, over the years, perhaps from uh, what we have experienced, you know, have played down on that. If you look at even the budget for science and tech, it's, it's very low. As a matter of fact, it didn't even get a mention this time around, uh, well, you know, uh, uh, and so on. So it is very, very pertinent, according to what I said. And if you look at all the nations that have developed, the Asian Tigers, who are part with Nigeria in the 70s, they have gone far, far beyond us in all aspects of development, the education, agriculture, name it. And these are areas that require science and tech for them to move on. Okay. And that's, what, that, that, that's just the matter. But when we return from this break, you know, perhaps you come in again and let us know uh, what you intend to do. Because the ball is now in your court with respect to 2020 budget. This is Good Morning Nigeria. We will come back and when we return, we will first say we'll be doing the concluding part of the conversation. Do stay with us. For more than 10 years, NTA Educational Television has continued to champion the discovery of young scientists and artists across the country. The 2019 National Children's Expo promises to bring to light the best of innovations and creativity in the science and arts categories. Theme, promoting unity and innovations in youths as agents of change through science and arts. 
Venue, NTA Headquarters Arena, Area 11, Garki, Abuja. Date, Sunday, October 20th to Thursday, October 24th, 2019. For more information, please call the following numbers. This event is proudly supported by NTA ETV, promoting learning. you people sell imported materials here. As beautiful as the shop is. Auntie. Hmm? Buying foreign goods does not help our economy. Neither does it boost local production. And the good thing is Nigerian made products are high quality. Mm -hmm. And to make Nigeria great again. That is why I only sell made in Nigeria products. Because change begins with me. I'm convinced. Change begins with me too. <laughs> Change begins with me. This message is brought to you by the National Orientation Agency in conjunction with the Federal Ministry of Information and Culture. All right, welcome back, and it's still Good Morning Nigeria, live on the network service of the Nigerian Television Authority. We still have our guests, and uh, we have had a number of tweets that have come in. Kira, you remember yesterday we were hard-pressed uh, taking the tweets because we had four guests, and uh, that was part one of our conversation. So today, we're going to uh, take some of the tweets that have come in and then return to our guests. But I must see Haruna Adamo tweets. It's one thing to present and pass a budget, another thing for the budget to be religiously and judiciously executed. All right, from Delejak Solomon, as the Senate and House of Reps assure Nigerians of uh, cooperation and speedy implementation of 2020 national budget, all hands must be on deck to see to the success of this bill because Nigerians are tired of uh, uh, procrastination and lack of full implementation of budgets over the years. Chris Simeon, the money or rather the amount budgeted for recurrent expenditure is always bigger than the capital expenditure. And for us to attain development uh, in this kind of scenario will still be a mirage. Now, Mike Ayako says one of the most important aspects of 2020 appropriation bill is completion of existing projects. This is awesome and a very welcome development. Mention should be uh, made on security, health and education, as well as focus on the critical areas of the economy. Nigerians are impatiently waiting. Now, first was Akimbo Ewa. Uh, I was expecting the chunk of the budget to go for health care, education and pension. It worries me that the allocation for education and health is extremely low. All right, Dr. Solomon, once again, the uniqueness of the 2020 budget is that appropriation bill seeks to establish a domestic tax law to align with global best practices as well as uh, support small and medium enterprises. Through this means, both local and foreign investors uh, would be motivated to do business in Nigeria. Dada Steven has this tweet. Say, what is the use of 82 billion naira in water resources? All houses I know have boreholes and pumping machines. <laughs> Our waterways are also full of water hyacinth. and explanation is needed. Now, all homes and all houses don't have dams right, exactly, in the first exactly, instance. Exactly. And we can't continue to rely on rain-fed agriculture. So part of irrigation that will come out from uh, those major dams are things that uh, the Water Resources Ministry would need that for, not just boreholes exactly. that we have in our homes. Jack Solomon says that while the federal government based uh, the 2020 appropriation bill on the new tax rate to help finance health, education, and infrastructural programs in Nigeria, government must ensure it does whatever it requires to ameliorate the sufferings of the Nigerian people and budget executed as planned. This is from Omobola on Babs. The budget has exempted companies with less than 25 million 
Nara Anwar turnover from VAT. Now, this, the first in the history of Nigeria. Kudos must be given to Mr. President. This will ensure that those SMEs and MSMEs will not necessarily add their VAT burden uh, on the masses who are final consumers. Again, this is part of the lingering confusion over how to implement uh, that particular aspect. Mm -hmm. Does it mean that you go to a company that has a turnover of less than 25 percent that you will not be charged VAT from your purchases uh, from that company? It's indeed difficult to implement. That's right. Um, All right. Okay. Okay. Law Alpha C said the task is now left for the National Assembly to expedite action to meet up with the deadline and for the executive to ensure efficient implementation. Okay, well, th those are the uh, tweets, uh, Kira, we can accommodate in the meantime. Exactly. Uh, I, I'm, just, I'm just wondering, uh, can we really, considering the circumstances of, of the 2019 budget and then the 2020 appropriation bill, bemoan the fact that we'll most likely have a revenue challenge in 2020? Let me put this on the table. The 2019 appropriation bill became a law in June this year. And part of what has also been applauded is the fact that we are trying to return to a January to December budgetary cycle. That's to say in 2020. But in conception, the 2019 budget was expected to run from June 2019 up until 2020. So if 2020 is taken as a tabula rasa to say, look, we have nothing there. This is our proposal for it. This is how much we are expecting for 2020. This is how much we, are expected, uh, we, we expect to spend. This will be the deficit. This will be our borrowing X, Y, Z. What will happen to the remainder of the aspects of the 2019 budget at the time that budget lapses by the provision of a clause in the 2020 Act? that will override 2019 and say, okay, from 2020, fresh budget, but what will happen to all the issues in the 2019 appropriation, including the revenue stream, that ordinarily would have gone up until June 2020? Well, uh, let me say that it is very important for people to note that uh, the budget has three components, the personnel costs, the overhead cost, and the capital. The personnel aspect of the budget runs from January to December. There is no issue with that one. The overhead aspect of the budget runs from January to December. There is no issue of that one. So the issue of project revenue, already we have a revenue challenge. So the major issue is on capital. And we are all aware over the years, we have never implemented capital 100%. Sometimes it's 30%, 40%, 50%, 60%. So by aligning the budget of 2020 of the capital aspect run from January to December, all it requires is that you now call it an act. And there is no act that cannot be amended by the National Assembly. So that particular clause in 2029 budget will be amended to allow the capital to terminate by the end of December or the date in which the budget is passed. And I don't think it will have issue, because already, on the basis in trying to align the budget, government is rolling over 60% of capital to 2020 budget, which means the likely maximum capital implementation is going to be around 40%. It will be run over to the 2020 budget, and the budget will be aligned. But on the issue of whether the six months, it only affects capital aspect of it. And over the years, we have never exceeded 70% of implementation of capital. I think the last time we, 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 I think it was in 2018 that we had about 70% implementation. So all other all, all times, you find that we always have that particular deficit on implementation of capital. So there is no issue there. But you see, uh, uh, Chrisley, what played out over the years? has been a abysmal implementation of national budget. The, the cycle was changed. And, and then what is left for, for, for National Assembly and the other uh, you know, you know, actors is just to, whatever is possible, you, you get it done. So yeah. when this one lapses, another one begins. But if by the time uh, the current administration returns the, the, the budgetary uh, uh, cycle to January to December, yes. it could be a better 
planning, there could be better planning, you know, in terms of not necessarily uh, implementing the budget, but then ensuring that uh, whatever plans, whatever structure put in place to see how uh, you know, the government can generate revenue to implement those budgets. Because all, what after all said and done, what is important here is implementation <laughs> of policies of government enshrined in the in the budget. Clear, right. Clear. And, and, my, my, my point, uh, the question I, asked, I raised, and I would like the other guests mm -hmm. uh, uh, to also speak to this, let's say Yushua Angle, it has to do with the, what you may now refer to as a transitional arrangement mm -hmm. from Appropriation Act 2019 to Appropriation Act 2020 and whatever funds were embedded in it. I mean, the presumption could be that, okay, to the extent that we were quote unquote lawless in implementing previous budgets, not having a budgetary performance capital uh, up to 50% or 60%, so that now might serve you know, our needs. I'm saying, if were there, there were revenue expectations to fund 2019 budget up until uh, June 2020. Now, uh, there, there are already revenue shortfalls, no doubt about that, mm -hmm. but in terms of accounting, so that you don't say that 2020 is a tabula rasa, you were not expecting okay. anything. That's that's the point that I, I, I actually no, hang on a second. Mm. Hang on a second. Okay. Uh, Associate Prof. Yushua Ango, what's your take on this? I mean, is it a matter that can uh, be explained? So I think the honourable member has explained uh, it very brilliantly. Uh, the uh, recurrent aspect of it has already been spent. Uh, the capital aspect of it. Even from the presidential pronouncement, you know, they are rolling over and they are not starting any new project except they have to. Uh, so that shows that uh, it's a continuum. And then also, uh, like the Honorable Member said, the, we have not been able, uh, we have never been able to implement a uh, high percentage of the, uh, of the capital budget usually. In fact, in the previous administration, it used to be 30% or 20% or thereabout. Now, uh, the, the realistic nature of this budget, to my, in my opinion, is the fact that we are rolling over, we are not trying to start new projects, we are trying to finish those other projects. I think that uh, the, the Honourable Member put it correctly. Uh, there is no confusion, there is no problem. Uh, they will just roll over and they will, those projects, and they will continue to spend on those projects that are already being implemented and start few ones that are necessary. I, that is my understanding. Okay, um, let's return to Dr. Michael King. Dr. Michael, the budget is pegged on an um, oil benchmark of about fifty-seven dollars uh, per, per barrel. You know, with a projected deficit of about two point one eight you know, trillion naira. You have actually identified fault lines in, in, in the budget. Now, if you are to be in charge of uh, giving direction to what can be done, first to realize enough revenue to address the critical infrastructure, for instance, education and the other very important sectors of the, of the economy. What would you do? And if you are perhaps uh, on an advisory note, how would you now uh, advise the National Assembly, who is presently uh, working on the budget? Thank you. I'm, I'm very happy when the Honourable said that it is a responsibility to be able to develop the laws that can make things run a lot more smoothly. The first thing I will say to him, is let's go back to the days of our rolling plans. If we had a rolling plan, what you can call an implementation program, an implementation framework, that now has a three-year cycle, like the MTEF. Okay. okay? Remember that you have your MTEF, your fiscal strategy paper. What you don't have now is a rolling plan, okay, that now ties you to outputs. If we had a rolling plan that ties to outputs, first and foremost, what you would have identified are those capital projects that need to be completed so that they can now begin your revenue stream. I'll give you a very simple example. Abuja is densely populated. A lot of people live at all the angles of Abuja. Imagine if we had a light rail system that accounted for every citizen in this federal capital territory spending a minimum of 2,000 naira, and you have about 5 billion people. I just want to start talking about very, very practical revenue generation streams. Now, that monorail or rail project would have been top priority, okay? That can you now capture in your implementation program. Each time, if you notice when you were talking about the projections of the millions of barriers are cringed, do you know why Nigeria Republic is refusing 
to start producing their oil. They say that they want to have it all thought through, that they are going to be having refineries before they start producing any crude. They are not interested in selling one drop of their crude. It is us only, go and check this history, we are the only country that are still operating what you call the multinational oil companies. All others in our league have all gone to their national oil companies. And what have they done? They are no longer interested in crude because they know that crude is what it is, crude. That where actually industrialization is, is what people call the byproducts of crude, which are the industrial gases. So for a country, if we now also decided that this is going to be fluctuating, is a market we are not sure of. We are selling crude, gentlemen, and then spending close to 95% of what we sell in crude to be able to now import the products that we are using. That comes out as crude, and it's actually the byproduct that nobody needs. You know why? There is no industry that runs on fuel. Fuel is leisure. So if we have an implementation program, and if the National Assembly can be able to sit down and say, okay, we make laws. Remember that what the president has just come to you know, present is, is, is an opinion, if you may, if you want to bring it out to what it is. The people who have the hammer and the nail is the man sitting in front of us. And by the time they finish, the president either says yes or says no. And they can obtain that 10 trillion we're talking about. Now, by the time they finish with it, they say it's 25 trillion. They have the powers to do that because it is them that by law that now produces the act. And if the president refuses to sign, they can even veto him. So every power, we should be holding the people in National Assembly to say, can you look at all these uh, physical laws and see how they are now turning into a major stumbling block? You cannot have a president who has promised 100 million jobs, 10 million every year, and then in a budget says, I'm not going to be employing any new persons. And then you now have physical acts that now make it impossible for those sectors that can be able to now help him achieve his primary goal, which is to be able to get every Nigerian. I digress a little. Look at us talking about toll gates. Nigerians want good roads. You go to the social media and they say, this government is evil. They are trying to reintroduce toll gates. Yet, People are going around taking photographs of roads and throwing it into the social media to say government is not doing anything. Yet you don't want to tow the road. Because in towing that road, you can actually introduce way bridges. Look at us talking about a, a, a market that has 30 trillion as output. And I'm talking about the cattle market. And then some people say, no, my land is not going to be part of it. But every morning, you go to their houses and there's no meat in their soup. No matter how close you are with them, their wife won't bring out that food. They would rather tell you that the soup has spoiled than bringing out food that has no meat inside it. Look at us that are talking about engaging into developing. We have 600,000 hectares of wasteland. India is producing jet rofa. They are looking for wasteland. China has converted over 30% of its desert into green lands using technology. What are they growing there? Jet rofa. Cactus or puntus. These are grasses that animals consume. Yet we have all this wasteland. We have over 300 dams in Nigeria. Not one, not one has been tied to this NLTP program. Not one has been tied to forest production. Not one has been tied to agricultural production. Not one has been tied to any major. You know why? Because the honorable people are saying no. The, the Minister of uh, uh, Water Resources will say, what's our business with the Minister of Defense? Whatever it is they want to do, our own is to oversight them and make sure that they are bringing revenue and we're not oversighting them. It is not going to work. If we put in all these monies that we've put into capital, do you know what can happen? We'd have been able to have now saved or put into place this major bulk that you need to be able to borrow against PPP projects. Okay. And then, sorry, on a last note, these projects will now begin to run on what we call project-based finance models. Do you know what it means? Cash flows, so that you don't do anything that does not have a return on investment. It does not have to be physical cash. It can be human capital development. This is how your human capital development index begins to unlock. This is where we're missing it. Yeah, uh, uh, Dr. Mecca Okengo, thank you very much for uh, the points you have raised. Uh, just to uh, indicate, I'm sure that some 
persons will disagree when you say that none of our dams is tied to agricultural production. I mean, the number of the dams. No, that's uh, what I, I didn't say that. Uh, uh, I said it's not tied. Okay, please go ahead. Let me. Yeah, that's 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 what I had. What, what exactly did you want? Did, did now, you say? what I was trying to say is that in, in using your dams, you do not build dams just for agriculture alone. Dams that have pen stocks. Okay, Zamfara, the, the dam in Zamfara has a capacity to generate about 16 megawatts of electricity. Are we doing that? Is it integrated to any major program? So probably I use agricultural program as a typical all example. Right, all right. If you do not have a, a holistic national map of where infrastructure, okay, supports the real sector, and where the real sector is supported by the private sector, and where the private sector is supported by government, and then you have a bulk Okay, of what you now call your captive market or your primary market. And what is it? You have 200 million people with disposable income of 55 Naira. How are you able to now give them services to make certain that you return 2 Naira or 3 Naira out of that 5 Naira? That's the point I'm trying to make. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, very quickly, uh, you saw Ango. Uh, the, the president uh, did say that there will be a successor plan to ARGP, that's the Economic Recovery and Growth Plan which expires or runs out in the year 2020. And, and hopefully we'll return to uh, uh, planning as we used to know it in this past, whether five years or 10 years. But some analysts would wonder on the basis of which uh, we're going to be planning. For instance, no mention of a population census in 2020 or any time soon. I mean, that is, um, we have that challenge, and um, I know maybe part of the problem why we, do, we don't do these censuses uh, is the cost element of it, but we need to. Uh, we need to ensure that we have enough data to plan. We cannot plan without uh, data. Uh, having said that, I also, uh, uh, maybe, I don't know that I'll have the opportunity, but let me say that uh, uh, both the executive and um, legislature uh, have done well, I mean, at least in, the, in getting this um, uh, budget presented, and I hope also to be de deliberated upon and approved uh, before the end of the year. Now, but another thing that I think uh, we, have said, we have seen from the budget clearly uh, is that it's a, realist, it's a realistic budget, it's a conservative budget. Uh, it, we are trying to really work with what we have. Uh, we have said at the beginning of this discussion that uh, we have challenge of revenue, obviously, and that probably is why, uh, from the comments of yesterday, one of the uh, panelists was saying that we had a budget, a capital budget of two point something billion. I mean, for I mean, trillion. Sorry, for a country, uh, with this is too small and all that and all that. That is also true. But uh, I think there are two things or three things that we need to do. One, uh, the National Assembly should, as much as possible. Uh, look at this budget dispassionately, rem remo remove whatever is not necessary, but please they should not add their own. You know, they shouldn't add their own, which is the, the normal thing that has, ha has been happening before, which they call constituency projects, or which is also referred to as padding. They shouldn't do that. The second thing, which is important, you know, even with the 2.14 or there about trillion we have, as much of it that we can spend and you know, to patronize Nigerian businesses, Nigerian people, the more we can do that, the better, rather than exporting those businesses to outsiders and providing employment you know, to outsiders. If we do that, then gradually our own revenue base will also increase. Our... Okay, we'd like to thank you, uh, Yushua uh, Angle. Thank you very much indeed for your contribution this morning. We're just trying to round off uh, this edition of the program. But before that, uh, let's get uh, you, your final uh, uh, comment. Uh, you were of the 7th, 8th, and now the 9th Assembly. Uh, taking from what uh, 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 Yushua just said, um, are there assurances that National Assembly will this time expedite action on the budget without what uh, Angle said, uh, padding, uh, and again without also being a, a rubber stamp? Well, uh, before I made my comment, I want but to correct briefly. two statements quickly. Number one, a statement that was made that the president said there won't be any employment. That is not correct. What the president said is that any MDE that want to employ should seek for approval. Okay. That's uh, number one. Number two, on the issue of 25% uh, threshold, what I said is that the National Assembly will look at implementation challenges. Whether it's there are going to be any implementation challenges, will they get them? Now, on the issue of uh, the 
one of the uh, producers of this program mentioned that we have the power, even doctor said we have the power of uh, approving the budgets. Mm -hmm. So if we have the authority and power to approve, amend, add and insert, I don't think if the action of the National Assembly will be seen as pardon or illegality because the bottom line of a budget document is about the people. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you indeed. Uh, Honorable Babangida Ibrahim, Chairman, House Committee on uh, Capital Market and Institutions, uh, thank you very much indeed uh, for okay. coming this morning. And the uh, usual angle, Dean Post Graduate School, Cardinal State University, uh, we, we, we thank you for your thoughts this morning. And of course, uh, uh, Dr. Emeka Okengu, who uh, has become a regular here when we're talking about uh, finance. Uh, uh, Emeka, thank you for Pleasure. your contributions. Now, let's take you on sports. Wilfred